All right, my friends, we are live again. Three live streams in one week. What other channel gets you there? Audioholics gets you there. How's it going, Teo? How are you doing, my friend? Gene, it's going great. Uh, I can't think of any better way to spend a Sunday night than to be with you and talk about a topic that we have been going over for the past couple of weeks, and that is Odyssey and how most people, especially our enthusiasts who own either a Denon or a Marantz AVR and have run Odyssey, probably aren't getting peak performance out of their equipment. Yeah. You know, I got... As you are aware, I've been a huge Denon fan since, you know, basically since I started Audioholics in the 90s. Um, I actually tested the very first Odyssey product I had on the Denon AVR 5805. It was the first iteration of Odyssey. And back then they had the little hockey puck microphone. So it didn't even have like, you know, it wasn't like that thin uh, kind of Eiffel Tower shaped microphone that they have now. And at the time when they released the 5805, it didn't even do anything to the subwoofer channel. Like, and I measured it, and I remembered I pissed off a lot of people at at uh, at Odyssey and, and uh, Denon because the implementation wasn't right. So they had to go back to the drawing board and make a change on uh, firmware on the very first receiver with Odyssey because it didn't do anything for the subwoofer channel. So there's a big history there. And then a few years later, when they came out with the Odyssey standalone box, it was an eight channel. Actually, it was a very good product. It was an eight channel box, very sophisticated DSP in it. And I had uh, the former chief technical officer, Chris Kiriakaki, is another Greek. Yeah, the Greeks had him over, Yeah, so I had him over my place. And that's when we started messing with multi-sub and how to do it best on Odyssey. And at the time, uh, I came to the conclusion that the best way to run uh, auto EQ or or subwoofer management and calibration is to get the delays and the levels correct first. And obviously the position of the subs, then you run a global EQ to all the subs if they're properly set up. And as a result of that, uh, the latest version of Odyssey now does just that. So if you have a new Marantz or a new Denon receiver, it will check the delay and the, t and the levels of each sub before it applies that global EQ to both subs simultaneously. And, you know, Gene, we've been talking about this for many, many years, how global EQ is really the right way to do it. And I think that uh, there's a misnomer that what you want to do is you want to make every single sub flat. And that's really not going to give you the best base performance uh, in your primary seat or if you're trying to EQ across a variety of seats. The wrong way to do it. Yeah, I mean, just to, just a recap on the benefits of multi sub, and I see a lot of put it this way: I do about five consults a week now um, of people that want me to help them get their system sounding better or, or you know performing better. And I always see people putting a subwoofer on each side of the center channel, and I'm like, you know, that's not really multi sub. That's basically one large sub. In order to get bass distribution, even bass distribution throughout the room, you really need to put subwoofers in the right locations of the room and they usually don't align right at the front wall you know three feet apart right and the great thing is we're going to talk about all that in a little bit yeah. and give everybody a refresher um because you know if we look back odyssey started what was it right around 2002 or yep. so you know it's incredible where we've gone with this technology um i'll remember speaking of uh greeks i happened to visit uh michael k uh, Michael K or Michael Carcadelis was the owner of Lyric Audio in uh, Manhattan. And I happened to visit him uh, one time just out of the blue. And we found out that we're from the same village in Greece, our uh, family. So we, we really hit it off. Nice. And uh, Mike took me into the back room. And those of you who have been to hi-fi stores know that there is a back room. And that's where all the best audio equipment is. And I don't remember what it was, maybe 20 uh, some odd years ago. And it was the first time that I really understood what an important role the room plays. I remember that listening session. It is the most vivid listening session I've ever had. And I still remember it was a pair of NOLA baby grands. It was an audio research uh, pre, uh, you know, the amplification. But when you hear audiophiles talk about creating a window, 
The room was amazing. He spent a million dollars on that room. It's physically isolated from the rest of the building, from the subway. It had an acoustic waveguide in the ceiling, if I remember correctly, carpeting. Everything was designed to perfection. And mm. the problem becomes, as great as that sounds when you demo the equipment there, when you bring it home, you have the reality of how your room is going to be and all those problems. Oh, and yeah. While EQ has done such a great job, if you just use everything, especially Odyssey, at its defaults, you're probably still not going to get the best performance and possibly introduce some additional problems and trying to figure out why your speakers aren't sounding like they should. Yeah, and, and the one thing I want to bring to um, bring more awareness to, I, I um, I've I've heard dealers in the past say. You know, you don't need to worry about room acoustics or do any treatments in your room because you have auto EQ that'll take care of all of that. That is never the case. Okay. Auto EQ is not a substitute for getting your room acoustics right first. It's 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 like having a good cake and then putting some icing on it. If you don't have the good foundation, you're not gonna have any benefit from the auto EQ. So I want I want to make sure people realize that uh, the first thing we recommend is getting your room acoustics right. Like for example, that glass door behind me, that's not good. I mean, this room does not sound good as it is now, and I'm going to fix that. I just want people to realize there's things that you could do, even if you can't afford to put room treatments in your room or the wife doesn't like seeing that stuff. We're doing a weekly um, broadcast with Anthony Gramani on room acoustics, and we're going to dive into deeper topics there. But there are things you could do naturally to fix your room acoustics and get that sound as good as you can. And when you go to apply room EQ, it works a lot more effectively when you get your room acoustics right first and you get the positioning of your speakers and your listening area. You got to optimize all that stuff first. Exactly. Exactly. And if you even look at the Odyssey documents or any room correction documents, they always state you want to get the setup right. And what we'll talk about in a little bit is how important it is to play the room. And, you know, to do that with some music that really uh, starts with some foundational bass, because getting the bass right is where you need to start when you're positioning your speakers. And once you've got the bass dialed in, then you can tweak and adjust the placement uh, for the mid range uh, and the high end. Yep. So I'm going to share your screen so you can, uh, I appreciate you putting this slide presentation together. That always helps to have good illustrations. Great. So uh, why don't we just spin it up here? So we're going to talk about a very practical session today of how to set up and optimize Odyssey. So when we talk about Odyssey, at least as it pertains to modern uh, AVRs and pre-pros, we're really talking about uh, Denon and Marantz. Uh, so it's really the Sound United brands um, that have maintained Odyssey. And as we were just talking about, can't emphasize enough, begin with the basics. Don't just get a great setup, great speakers, slap them against the wall in the corners, and then say, oh, I'm going to run Odyssey. It's going to fix everything. No, that's not going to give you great sound. Uh, always start with proper speaker placement. And a good tip and trick is to play the room. And what you want to do when you play the room is you want to start, at least I do, with some two-channel music and really start to position the speakers, as we were saying, where the bass is going to sound great. There's a couple of tracks that I really like to use that over and above some of the classics that you hear all the time. Holly Cole is a great start with her uh, I Can See Clearly Now uh, cover and Train Song, two really classic songs that have good, tight, clean bass. And here it's about the quality of bass. If you want to then go to Sade's Soldier of Love, just really great dynamics, solid bass. And then if you want something that's really gonna give you more of that subsonic, deep, deep room shaking bass, Bonnie McKee's Trouble is fabulous. Of course, Lord's Royals, and you may not have heard of Katie Malua's, but Sailing Ships from Heaven, another great uh, track for testing bass. And I always like to have a lap from the uh, Trolls motion picture soundtrack, Hair Up. Crank it up and it'll be a great way to test some bass in your system. But the point here is that your room 
is as much a part of your audio system as your equipment. You can have mediocre speakers, place them just right in a great sounding room, and they could outperform far more expensive speakers that aren't properly placed in a poor sounding room. So you've got to start first and foremost with speaker placement. Don't shortcut it. Otherwise, anything you try to do with Odyssey or any other room correction is not going to give you the results and the potential that is there. You know, it's funny, Teo, when, with your source material there. Um, years ago, when Shane Rich from RBH Sound came over my place to set up, I think it was maybe the T30s or something, like two generations of flagships ago, um, he introduced me to an artist named Diana Reeves. I don't know if you ever heard of her. Um, there's a CD called Never Too Far. Huh. I'm sure we played it because, as we know, Shane, as a shout out, is the nicest guy on the planet. He is. He yeah. won the nice off against you. <laughs> he did. You, you're never going to live that down. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when he came out, he introduced me to something else as well. And we were testing out the uh, RBH SVTR Tower speakers, which I have here. I love unbelievable speakers. Yep. And uh, it was really Aaron uh, Copeland's uh, fanfare the, for the common man by the Minnesota Symphony Orchestra. I mean, you want to talk about, again, something with dynamics and bass, great track. So anyway, Shane, as you were saying. So he introduced me to this Diana Reeves track and I, I uploaded it into my Yamaha MusicCast system, the old system that actually has a hard drive. And I, when I went back before I moved into this new house, I was looking at my hard drive just to see the common songs I'd listened to. And that thing was like, I think I listened to that one track, track number two, like 3,500 times over the, over the last like six years because I just, I'm so familiar with the bass and, and, you know, it's like you get sick of a song to a point, but when at the end of the day, I always try to get, and it's critical to get your main speakers and your subs playing well together. If you get that, that's 90% right there. So you got to use something you're really familiar with bass wise, obviously measurements, of course, but listening tests, you know, if you can't do all the measurements, you got to at least know what the bass should sound like with something you're very familiar with. Absolutely. And then you want to take it to the next level of bass performance. The key is really going to multiple subs. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about this so many times, but th this is just so important is a single sub is simply not going to give you optimal bass in a room. It's just not within oh, the laws of physics. other than for one other than for, for one, one very narrow pitch. listening area yeah. correct right so uh what i did here is i took some excerpts of one of your articles from a couple of years ago and i thought it was important because what it really does it highlights what the science teaches us about subwoofer placement so if you're doing two or four subs so i'm going to talk about multi-sub here the science says that in an, in an average rectangular room you either put the subs in the four corners of the room or the midpoints of the room. So both corner and midwall subwoofer placement will help address room modes. And the other, which I do here in my setup, is the quarter and three quarter subwoofer placement. So you go from either the left wall or the right and then the rear and you do one quarter in and three quarter or one quarter from either side. And conversely, that also works on the side walls, left and right. So these are proven placement for multiple subs that will give you the best base performance that will then help a system like an Odyssey perform its best when it goes for EQ. And as now, you said- Now, I'll, let, I'll add something to that. If you go back to the uh, prior diagram, years ago when Todd Welty was doing all the simulations on the various subwoofer positions, um, even THX, they were all doing four mid-wall sub locations. And I've set up systems like that. And yes, you get the best C to C consistency that way, but you don't get the best low frequency coupling factor. So if you could put them all in the corners, if you notice now, if you go to any of the trade shows, like I was at Cedia when JBL did their synthesis demo, they ran two subs in each corner. So they had two, four, six, eight subwoofers and they did all four corners. And that's because with good EQ, 
you get reasonably, first of all, you get reasonably good C to C consistency. So the EQ works across all the listening areas, but below 30 Hertz, those four corner subs act like one giant super sub in their low frequency coupling factor. You don't get that much efficiency when you do the four mid wall. So if you're going to do two subs, mid walls are okay, like front and back. But if generally speaking, if you're going to do four in a rectangular room, if you could do the corners, you could even put them to the side corners. So you could put them in a wall. You know, you could put them in the ceiling. There's just a lot of different options there. I just wanted to add that. And Gene, you also, if you stick them in the corners, you also get a up to a 3 dB boost in the low frequencies, right? So you get that reinforcement that if you're doing mid-wall placement or quarter wall, you won't necessarily get. And then you could EQ out any anomalies that might result from the corner placement. Yeah, actually, yeah, actually, you get like for every for every surface, if it's infinitely long, which they're not, you get actually up to 6 dB. So it's, you know, corner loaded would actually give you an extra up, up to 6 dB. But yeah, you're right. You definitely get more boost when you put them in a wall in the corners. So for uh, baseaholics, that's a good tip uh, that they can go off of. So as you mentioned, and I quoted you here, it's important that global EQ, even in systems such as Odyssey, cannot change seat to seat variations, right? What we have to do is we have to use multi-sub. So that's the point um, yep. of this. So when we look at Odyssey, okay, and configuring multi-subs, Odyssey uses what it calls a uh, sub-EQ home theater. And what it does, you'll notice when you first launch Odyssey, so we're starting to get into the more practical elements now, Odyssey will automatically adjust the level and then the delay for each subs. It does that independently first. And then what you'll notice is for every single measurement thereafter, multi-EQ XT32 is then applied to all subs together as a sum. So yeah, right. I have the Denon uh, 8500H, okay? So when you have a situation, you may, may be wondering is, gee, it's important that I EQ all the subs and you know this AVR or this pre-pro only has two sub outs. That's okay. You just use a Y adapter. Use a Y adapter and that way you just pair up, for example, the front and the rear subs and then they, again, they get EQ'd as a sum. So it is not that big of a deal for, and I know there have been some forums where people have you know, gone off is I need four, six, eight subwoofer outputs. You don't. As long as you're doing that, it works fine. And in my setup, what I've done, Gene, we've talked about that. I've had SVS subs in the back um, wall. I've had the RBH uh, on the front wall. And then I've been able to EQ all the subs just by using Y adapter. So that's the way to do it. And, and to add to that, if you're worried about um, only having two sub outs with four subwoofers, try to group each pair uh, with equal path differences to the listening area. So um, if you only have two delays, then make sure that when you put two subs on one output that they're equidistant from the listening area. That usually works best when they try to sum together. And Gene, we were talking about this earlier. So if, we're, if someone's listening and they say, well, just tell me what to do, really the easiest thing is if you have the subs at the front, they're probably going to be in the same phase. Same thing with the subs in the back of the room. So it just makes sense to pair, let's say, sub output one to the subs that are in the front and sub output two to the subs in the back. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so now we're gonna turn to Odyssey's multi EQ editor app. So from now on, anytime someone is talking about Odyssey, you have to spend an additional $20. After you spent hundreds or thousands of dollars on your AVR, make the 1999 investment because you cannot you cannot get peak performance out of Odyssey without the multi EQ editor app, period, stop. So don't run it through the AVR, do yourself a favor and buy the app. We're gonna get into that a little bit more, why that is so important. So everything we're gonna talk about from here on out has to do with the multi EQ editor app, forget what's in the AVR. And I wanna to add to the fact that if you, if you do go with the multi EQ editor app, it's best that you have like an iPad or some type of touchscreen device that's bigger than your phone. Because if you try to do any type of precision in, in terms of changing the response or the shape of the EQ that the curves come out, 
very difficult to do it with a phone. It's just the, unfortunately the app isn't the greatest app in the world. And that's why it's got a three out of five stars. Yeah. If you're pointing to it right now, it works a lot better with a big screen, like an iPad. Agreed. And I've run it on both. So I can, I can uh, absolutely tell you that that's the case. You can get far more detail um, with the frequencies you want to hit uh, using an iPad. So before you start, now we talked about how important it is for placement. Um, I love using a laser tape measure. I have my Bosch, anytime I'm setting speakers up in my room, I'm always measuring my distances with a laser tape. Uh, if you don't have a laser tape and you wanna use the string method, uh, make sure you're not using some nylon string that has some stretch to it, but it's just so important that your speakers are set up equidistant, especially your fronts. The second thing is throw away that awful cardboard stand that comes with Odyssey. <laughs> oh, okay, God, that's I don't so bad. even have that thing unpacked. It's just terrible. Yeah. Make a $25 investment, go down to the local music store or go online and get a microphone stand with a boom arm or a tripod. Uh, I use a, a microphone stand with a boom arm and it just makes the calibration so much easier and you're also getting a bit more accuracy. Um, one way that you can do it is clearly just move the microphone stand itself. What I've done is a little bit different. So I've created my own Odyssey measurement tool. So it's very simple, rudimentary. I just took a piece of wood and I have a couple of these in, in different dimensions. I have one that's in the shape of an X that I can show you when I'm done with the uh, slideshow. Um, and then this one, which is a little bit uh, easier and faster, and I've drilled holes and I simply sit and rest the microphone with a screw. Uh, and that way it rotates around. I have everything marked. And the most important thing is I'm keeping all of my measurements within the 20 inch from the primary listening spot that Odyssey recommends and really requires. I don't know if anybody understands that, is you're not supposed to do any of your measurements more than 20 inches from the primary listening spot. And Did if they you, say 20? I thought it was two feet. Um, 24 is correct. Yeah. I absolutely do not recommend going to 24. And yeah. one of the reasons why, I mean, this is me, so I'm glad you brought that up, Gene, as a personal preference, is because, you know, not all speakers have good off-axis performance. And the more you get off-axis from that primary listening spot, we're going to start to get some measurements that may or may not show some of that off-axis poor performance that other speakers are going to have. I don't recommend, and you shouldn't, we'll talk about this, do eight measurements in the primary listening spot, that's really bad. But I recommend somewhere 20, 18 inches. That's what I found to work really well for me in my setup. You know, it's funny when I, every now and then I walk into a Best Buy, the Magnolia room, and I just want to, you know, I'm not there to troll. I just want to see what people know that the people that are selling you the equipment. And I got into it with this guy that was uh, demoing a Marantz receiver and he was telling me how great Odyssey is. I'm like, oh, that's cool, right? He goes, yeah, you know, and the great thing about this room correction is you could place the mic anywhere in the room. You could just place it around, put it by your seat, put it anywhere. And I'm like, geez, that really doesn't sound like it could work that way. But if this is what they're telling people. You just put the mic anywhere. No, it doesn't work that way. The, the system has to have data relative to the primary listening area for it to do anything that's worthwhile. Exactly. And, and you don't want to, you know what, what's interesting? I heard someone for the first time say what I didn't realize is if you look at the graphic that the Odyssey EQ app shows you, it actually shows the uh, measurements to be on the floor in front of the listening position and behind. Which is so, you know, a novice can make a genuine mistake, but we're talking it's got to be ear level. Ear level, no more than 20 inches from the primary listening spot is my recommendation uh, on that. So that's a personal thing. The second thing you want, and we'll get into why you need this, is an SPL meter. Uh, it can be analog, the old Radio Shack style. I still have mine. Uh, oh, but yeah. there's so many apps available now to make it easier. So there's a couple of free ones. Uh, just go to your app store and search SPL meter. Uh, and then there are some paid ones. Uh, if you're really serious about uh, what you're doing, there's a great set of paid tools uh, like audio tools 
which gives you a whole host of uh, additional tool sets like RTA, FFT, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in addition to um, an SPL. So Gene, this is why we're here, how to perform and perfect your Odyssey measurements. So we have uh, about 10 or so steps. So here's step by step. Number one, right. is obvious. You got to be quiet. Be as quiet as possible. So Odyssey will compensate if it hears sounds during calibration. I know this sometimes confuses some enthusiasts because then they'll be, oh my God, this one channel here is out of whack because then every time it does a sweep, that one channel gets louder. Well, here's what's happening. If audio, if, if Odyssey senses uh, a loud sound during a measurement, what it will do is it will remeasure that speaker and it will increase the volume of that speaker. That's normal, there's nothing to worry about. And what it will then do is every other sweep thereafter, that one speaker will be noticeably louder. It will not increase the final volume of that speaker. It's simply sensing some noise and raising the test tone to try to compensate for that. So that's a very important point. Mm -hmm. The second step is measuring at ear level. So here's my little tool. I've got my, my boom mic. And then Let's preface that and say seated ear level position. Seated ear decks. Very good. Seated ear level position. So the first measurement needs to be at that primary position when you're seated. Now, uh, I have home theater seats. And if you're in an environment where you too have home theater speed seats, play some music, put your head back into the backrest, the headrest, and then shift your head forward. You will notice a tonal shift. So your seat itself will impact the measurements. So sure. if you have the ability to recline your chair, recline the chair. Otherwise, you're going to have to move the microphone forward in order to get an accurate measurement. Again, in my opinion, no more than 20 inches from the primary listening position and try to measure each position equally. There are some folks who will tell you, and it's wrong. Well, it's only me. I'm going to do all eight measurements in the same position. That totally defeats the purpose of what Odyssey is trying to do. So that's step two. Are we okay with that, Gene? Anything we wanna add? Yeah, I think we're good. Um, definitely put, definitely recline your seats. I do that anyways, when I just do any room measurements at all, I keep that surface of that seat away from the microphone. And then now we're getting into some of the good stuff. Subwoofer levels. This is going to drive you bad, <laughs> right? So yeah. there were some comments in the chat uh, while everybody was waiting to go live. So here's the answer to the question. Yes, if you have calibrated your subs to 75 dB and you start Odyssey, it's going to tell you your subs are too loud. Then you have to dial back the volume of the sub, get it into that green area. Only then will you be able to continue with the calibration. So, yeah, it will it won't let you keep going if it sets too loud. No, not at all. So you're stuck. So don't worry about that. We we have a solution for that and we're going to get into this. Um but what I like to do and Gene you and I were talking about this we agree. I try to set it and you try to set it to that upper green area so it's just shy of the red and then that's where you and I both like to commence our calibration. Right. Now, the next step is phase. This is actually a really good thing about Odyssey is it will measure phase in addition. So generally speaking, as long as you've taken good care about connecting your positive and negative terminals correctly between the AVR and the speaker, everything will be fine. You won't have, if you don't have an inverted connection, everything will register fine. But there is an anomaly. So I also own the SVS Ultra Towers. And when I've had some Denon and Marantz AVRs in for review, and I've moved the speakers around and run Odyssey, I will sometimes get a phase error on one of the two speakers, sometimes both. And here's what's happening here. Um, Eugene, you and I talked about three-way speakers and speakers yeah. that have opposing woofers. They can sometimes lead to false phase errors. 
So what I've noticed on the SVS Ultra uh, towers is the closer they are to a left or right room boundary, the more likely it is to yield a false phase error. So the bottom line here is check the wiring. If you've got it correct, ignore the phase error and just move ahead. Well, then also another reason that could trip a phase error is, um, so I don't know if the SVS do this or not because I didn't review the Ultra Tower, but there are many three-way speakers that uh, they put the tweeter out of phase with the rest of the drivers so they have electrical, uh, the electrical phase is out of phase so they could get acoustic summation proper. And when you do that with these room EQ systems, they automatically trigger an error in the phase. So that's a very distinct possibility that it could be a deliberate design choice by the manufacturer that's causing a false phase error. Agreed, agreed. And then the next is after you've run Odyssey, you've done a successful calibration, check the results. Don't just assume Odyssey has done everything correctly. I mean, Gene, I, you and I haven't talked about this, but there have been some instances where I finished an Odyssey calibration and it's been significantly off with some speakers because of who knows what anomaly. So always check your measurements. So here from the primary listening position, my left and right, the RBHs are 8.9 feet away. That's correct. So never trust the auto EQ base management. And Odyssey, this is very, very important, is Odyssey will tend to assign small speakers to large when they're close to a boundary. Yeah. There's nothing wrong for a speaker to be assigned small. It doesn't mean you have a bad speaker. It's how all this is being measured. And Gene, why don't you speak about this next point? Because we had an extended conversation about your recommendation. I was talking about the uh, base management. Yeah, to just set all speakers to small. Yeah, I mean, I would say 95% of people that are watching this right now, there's a couple of bass heads out there that probably run really large speakers <laughs> like you and I do. But 95% of the people should have all the speakers set small, do it at crossover at 80 hertz. It just works better. It's easier to set up. It's very difficult to get full range towers, and it's very difficult to get full range towers that have the same kind of bass output as a dedicated subwoofer. Agreed. Agreed. And this is an area where I really want to make sure that nobody freaks out. So in this particular measurement, my sub one and sub two are eight feet, nine inches away because the SVTR tower has the sub module directly underneath the monitor module. So right. they're the same distance. Well, why then is Odyssey measuring 22.4 feet and 22.1. The answer to that question is, it's looking at all the delays that have to go through for processing on the subwoofer side, the LFE outside. So it's compensating for that. Now, there's different schools of thought on this. Um, Gene, you and I have talked about, let's say in my case, it would be totally appropriate to put the subs at 8.9 feet. But the key thing to take away is, as long as the subs are greater than the distance they actually are, that's okay. If, however, Odyssey measures your subwoofer distance less than they actually are, you've got a problem. So either you need to manually do it or consider redoing your measurements um, from scratch. I don't know what your deeper perspective is on that. I mean, it could just be hitting the 180 degree phase cycle, you know, or 360 degrees phase cycle. It's really hard to determine that. I, I've had weird results with Odyssey. Sometimes it gets the perfect phase settings and I'm like, I didn't expect it to be that distance. But then I go in and pull measurements with REW and sure enough, Odyssey's right. Other times it completely blows it. And you you actually have some graphs from one of my reviews. I think it's from the SR8012 yeah. where I ran Odyssey and the base calibration looked really bad until I adjusted the phase delay or the or the delays of the subs. Then all of a sudden my my base just really had great integration, better with Odyssey on than off. And we'll talk more about that later. So I guess my advice to you guys is trust the phase or trust the delay settings, um, but do some listening if you can't do measurements. And then you might have to adjust that a little bit. Agreed. And Gene, you and I are of the same opinion we prefer to turn off dynamic EQ and other auto leveling. So if you like accuracy, turn all that extra stuff off. And I'll note that a little bit more later on in the presentation. Yeah. And you know, what's funny is um, I didn't, 
I usually turn it off. The only time I would leave that on is if I'm listening at low levels and I just need a little bass boost. You know, I don't want to blow people out of the room. Um, but when I, when I was looking over your slide presentation, I thought to myself, ever since Dan and Morantz implemented the multi-sub for Odyssey, and it has that little level thing where it tells you to set it at 75, we both notice it sets it about four or five dB too low. Right. Well, that's I, I think it's because they have dynamic EQ now and they're trying to compensate for the extra margin they're going to need because dynamic EQ, if you look at my measurements, it could boost the sub levels about 10 dB. So I think they're compensating for that somewhat by making you set your sub levels by default too low. And, you know, maybe that's a good time to say it, that right now, if you stop at step five, you've done everything automatic, you turn on the music, you turn on a movie, you're going to be what happened to the bass? The bass has been totally sucked out of my system. Something's wrong. So we're going to get there. Hold on one second. This is something that drove me nuts. Oh, yeah. I just drove me nuts. So prior to the Odyssey app, I, and I think rightfully so, I thought Odyssey was terrible for music. I hated it. Uh, didn't like it at all. And come to find out what Odyssey does is it applies this thing called mid-range compensation. So if you are using Odyssey within the AVR, you cannot turn this off. Correct, Gene? You're stuck with this. I, you know, I think I think if you use the I think if you use the flat setting, it disables the two kilohertz. I could be wrong on that, but I know for a fact you could definitely turn it off in the editor app. The editor, exactly. And this is why we say if you're going to do anything with Odyssey, you've got to get the app. So by default, this is turned on. And what Odyssey is saying is well, the reason why they're introducing a dip at two kilohertz is about a three dB dip at two kilohertz is they're attempting to address what they say is the transition from the tweeter, the tweeter to the woofer uh, or mid range and that the directivity change yeah. right around that two kilohertz. But if you've got a high performance speaker, that is an, you're introducing something that is not in the speaker design. So we recommend if you have high performance speakers, turn it off. When I ran a, a measurement with Odyssey and I forgot to turn this off, I uh, ran it on the RBHs. I turned on some two channel music and I'm going, what on earth happened to the vocals? The yeah. vocals sounded smoothed over, processed. They lost a lot of the transparency that I knew was there. And sure enough, mid-range compensation was on. They really need to, they really need to take this out of their system. It's based on flawed lo flawed logic from, you know, like vintage speakers from the 70s and 80s. I mean, it's just anybody that's worth their salt in speaker design now doesn't have this big suck out at the you know, they just don't. I mean, it would show up in measurements. So yeah, um, that's the biggest the biggest takeaway here is uh turn that 2 kilohertz filter off. Absolutely. So right across the board. Um, and if you want to test it, just out of curiosity, listen to female vocalists. And as soon as you hone in on the differences, you'll be able to pick it up right away. So now we get to what we really love to talk about. So yeah. I want to add one more. I want to inter interrupt you one more time. The best way to determine if you like what Odyssey is doing is not to listen to it with all your speakers on. The best way to determine if you like it is to listen to it with just your two channel stereo because your brain is much more discernible on differences with two speakers playing as opposed to seven or 10 speakers playing. Yeah, two channels, the way to do it. Uh, and uh, Gene, you and I also agree, dial your system in with two channel music first before you start going to the home theater. Because if yeah. you dial your system into two channel, you can expand it out to, to multi. It's the two channel and your base that's really foundational to perfecting your setup. Definitely. So anemic base. This is one of, this is probably the number one complaint about Odyssey. And it's not a big deal if you understand what's happening and there's a way to fix it. So this is under the assumption that again, you've turned that dynamic EQ off. And what'll happen is Odyssey can under measure the sub and bass performance of your system by three to six dB. 
So I'm going to read you. I reran an Odyssey calibration uh, last week. And Gene, you and I were talking about this. So here's what happened. If I am going to, uh, let, let's use round numbers. So if I am trying to calibrate to 70 dB, Odyssey was giving me a six to six and a half dB less output on my two subs after Odyssey ran. So what you've got to do here, guys, is the following. Once you're done with Odyssey, you have to pull out that SPL and you have to calibrate everything to 75 dB, use the volume on your um, Rants or Denon AVR, uh, play some pink noise. And I have a link here uh, on Dyn Audio. There's a whole slew of WAV files for free that you can download and you can play through the AVR and you can run these test tones yourself and you'll see that there is a significant cut in bass. What now it's important it's important to note that if you use the if you use the pink noise in your receiver it doesn't I don't think it does that with Odyssey engaged. That's why you need to use the correct. external pink noise. That's correct. You if and that's an actually Gene, I'm so glad you mentioned that. If you use the manual cuz you you can run the um uh, the speaker levels in manual, but it's disabling Odyssey. That's my understanding. So yeah. all you're doing is running a parametric EQ, not full Odyssey. So you will not well, get accurate measurements. That's the manual. Opinion. Actually, the manual EQ is GEQ. I wish it was PEQ, but for some reason, Denon and Marantz have stuck with GEQ. I'm hoping, I've been asking them to change that for 15 years and they keep claiming it's going to happen eventually, but yeah, so if you run the internal pink noise of your receiver to try to calibrate all your levels, it's going to do it with not with Odyssey engaged. And one thing I also want to bring up is flat, every speaker should read 75 dB, like you said, but if you get flat bass in your room, you could actually boost the sub a, a good four or five dB higher than the rest of the channels if you have linear bass. Exactly, and you can do that as we'll talk about either directly on the sub, or you could do that later in the app with the curve editor. There's a couple right. of different ways to handle that. So if you've got anemic base, here's the thing, adjust it until the sub or subs measure the same SPL. Now, it may be intuitive for you to say, oh, okay, I have maybe two or four subs, I'm just going to measure each sub independently, get it to 75 dB and I'm done. No, wait, what happens is, the moment you add a second sub to the mix, you're actually getting a 3 dB boost to the total sum measurement. So for example, if you have one sub, yes, you wanna calibrate that to 75 dB. If you have two subs, you most likely wanna have those subs calibrated to 72 dB each, because when they're played together, they're gonna to give you a 3 dB boost and the sum will play at 75 dB. And if Unless you have, you have both subs to the to the sides of your center channel, then it'll add 6 dB because they're co-located. <laughs> so there you go. So measure, measure, measure. Um, and the other thing to note is do not do the editing of anything that we're talking about in the AVR. If you did the calibration in the app, any of these changes such as increasing the sub volume, keep it in the app okay. so i have a funny story about that when i reviewed the marantz sr8012 it was the first my first experience with the editor app and i had 11 speakers hooked up two subs i go in and run odyssey the conventional way thinking that afterwards i could go and open the app and change it no i had to rerun the entire calibration i wasted about 40 minutes running that whole setup it kind of sucks one thing i don't like about the app is you can't do on you, you can't do instantaneous changes and hear them right away, right? Anytime you make a change, you got to re-import it to the receiver. It takes time. So what I would recommend, and I hope I'm not getting ahead of you, This we have different speaker presets. Are you going to talk about that or should I wait? No, no, you can talk about it now. I do have that um, coming up as a specific slide. So if you want to wait, why don't we just tackle it then? Sounds good. I'll let you go. All right. So Gene, actually the next slides are all you. So yeah. your measurements. So why don't you talk about what you experienced when you did these measurements um, with Odyssey uh, for the next couple of slides here, and I'll advance them. 
Okay. So this is exactly what I was talking about. When I set up my system in my family room, I have kind of an asymmetric room in my old house, the family room open to the kitchen. I had diagonal sub placement on the opposite walls. When I ran Odyssey, you could see it in the red curve. There was a major suck out in the 60 to 100 hertz range. The reason for that was when Odyssey set the delays of my subwoofers, they didn't optimize it relative to my main speakers. Because anytime I do bass calibration, I do it with the main speakers playing and all the subs playing. So you could see right away I had a phase or a time misalignment. Once I dialed in better fight, better time delays on my subs, that blue trace existed. And that's a beautiful measurement right there. That's really flat. So Odyssey actually did flatten the response in the 20 to 30 hertz range which is great because the EQ worked, but at the critical crossover area, it screwed up my delays and I had to go and manually fix that myself. And I would not have been able to do that without making my own measurements. I mean, you could do it with music. You could do listening tests. It's a lot of trial and error, but the bottom line is if you want really precision sound in your bass and measurements, you got to take the measurements. So Gene, the other thing to note then is you know, some enthusiasts get confused because they think, oh, look at the Odyssey. It just gives me a totally flat curve. So that's what my speakers now sound like. But the reality is that's not actually the case in practice. And this graph highlights that. Yeah, definitely. So and that's just one. Right. That's just one mic. See, here's the other thing I notice. A lot of people, when they do their calibrations, they measure at one position. I'm not a one position kind of guy. I <laughs> it sounds wrong. Why did I go there? Um, I like to make sure that all my seats in whatever I'm listening to have good bass. So you could see here in my family room, I really only cared about the three seats. I had a couch that was properly positioned and then I had a couch. The other couch was on the sidewall and that's where I put the mother-in-law. So whatever happens there is fine. So I just wanted, I really wanted to dial in the bass here. And this is the bass I got in that room with Odyssey on with two subs integrated with my mains. And that's a, that's a beautiful measurement. That's a really linear bass for a very difficult room with non-optimal placement. The best bass you've ever measured in that room. So my benchmark when I set up systems is like in my theater room, I have two rows of seats. I always go for plus or minus five dB through the entire bandwidth of bass. So in this case, it was 18 Hertz to hundred Hertz. In my new system with the big RBH towers, I'll go down to about 15 Hertz. Uh, yeah so and it's going to be across seven seats that's great that's just great so what's your opinion about flat versus reference why don't you talk a little bit about that see the reference is that old kind of i think it's based on the old thx mantra of of over of rolling off the highs because the movie soundtracks are excessively bright when they get remastered into the home i just don't like the sound of reference. It really does taper off the highs too much. Personally, I don't like the sound of, in most cases, full range Odyssey. Um, I like to limit the bandwidth of correction, but in the instances where I did like what Odyssey was doing, it always has been in the flat setting because it doesn't roll off the highs. And I do, I'm about 90% confident it takes that two kilohertz notch out, even if you don't have the app. That's great. That's great. Uh, so step eight, our this is optional, but what we recommend is turning off dynamic EQ, turning off dynamic volume, and turning off the uh, LFC. Now, the LFC, just to comment on that for a second, how many times have we had folks posting in forums going, you know, my neighbor's complaining about the bass that right. it, we're playing? Well, this is a good application um, by using LFC because what it does, if I understand it correctly, is it takes the frequencies that are below 80 hertz and it pushes them up. So it's those really deep notes that are going to have the tendency to travel through walls. So this is actually a really smart option that Odyssey introduces that has a very specific application. So Gene, it, I it's, really it's actually not as smart as you think it is. It's basically a high pass filter. I've measured it. So it, it kills your bass response below about 35 Hertz. So use it only when the neighbors complain. Yeah. It's basically making your big sub a lot smaller. Exactly. Uh, and this is really the power of the app, uh, call it, is really the curve editor. So Odyssey back in the day used to have the consumer grade and then it used to have a pro kit. 
And yep. the pro kit allowed you to do the editing of curves. So now you have that power in either the tablet or your phone. And what's great is if you're doing measurements and you see where you do need to tweak Odyssey, you now have the ability to add points and curves. So let's say you're- This running, is a pain in the ass, by the way. It's a total pain. But yeah. if you're running Odyssey and you're like, okay, now I've just done my calibration, my base sounds anemic. I want to have a little bit of room gain. So what you could do is you could set a point right around 200, 250 hertz, and then you can elevate the base right around 3 dB, and now you can reintroduce some of that more natural bass that we're accustomed to hearing uh, in a room. So it's yeah, you could basically set it to the Harman target curve. Exactly. Uh, it is really easy to make a mistake. So unless you know what you're doing, don't touch the curve editor. But great power, great responsibility. With great power comes great responsibility. Absolutely. Uh, and then this is a good opportunity just to talk about something else. Uh, other Room EQ systems have, like Anthem's Arc, don't EQ above 5,000 hertz. Okay, so they do, I, they do now, actually. The yeah, Anthem's yeah. latest firmware, it does full bandwidth unless you select not. So the default, if I'm not mistaken, is still 5 kilohertz? When I when I ran Anthem or uh, Genesis, I'm sorry, not Anthem Arc, Arc Genesis, when I ran it uh, to do the STR uh, video a few weeks ago, it set it for full bandwidth. So I had to basically tell it to go to 500 hertz. Okay. So, Gene, you and I are fans of not EQing all the way up to 20 kilohertz. Because we have good speakers. I mean, that, yeah. <laughs> if you have good speakers, you don't really need to do it. So why don't you speak a little bit about the ability here? Odyssey allows you to limit how far you're going to EQ up to. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about the Schroeder frequency and why that might be an important option that some enthusiasts will want to take advantage of. So we've spoken about this in numerous other videos, even with Anthony Gramani. And basically, the most effective use of EQ is to do it below the Schroeder frequency or the room transition frequency. And that's where the room dominates the sound as opposed to the speaker dominating the sound. It's very difficult to do full bandwidth correction and for the microphone to understand what's a reflection in the room versus what's a bad off axis performance of the speaker. But below the couple of hundred hertz, that room from standing waves is what dominates what you're hearing. And that's why we need to do EQ. So in my experience using, whether it's Odyssey, Anthem Arc, YPOW is pretty useless. So I won't even include that. Uh, Pioneer's Mackie is useless. So I won't include that. And uh, I have a little experience with DRAC and a little experience with Trinov. But generally speaking, I prefer to limit my bandwidth of correction to about 500 hertz. So when what happens is if you listen to two channel music, what I notice with Odyssey in particular, it tends to give you a more, it, it gives you a stronger phantom center for two channel, but it also at the expense of collapsing the sound stage. That's been my experience with it. And sometimes like you said, it could sound processed. Right, right. So Gene, let's say somebody, I mean, there's lots of great articles out there on how to measure your room's Schroeder frequency. It's not the same in every room. So if somebody doesn't wanna go through the hassle of doing RTA measurements and what have you, our recommendation is basically pick 200 Hertz, 300 Hertz, give a listen. Odds are you're probably going to hit somewhere close to the Schroeder frequency uh, for your room if you're just ballparking it there. Yep. All right. And then this is actually a really cool feature. I don't have it on the 8500 and I'm jealous. So <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've used, um, I've been familiar with, with Anthem Arc for many, many years. And one of the things that I loved about Anthem Arc is I could have up to four measurements. So you, you might be thinking, well, why would you do four measurements? I'm not talking about measuring in eight locations. I'm talking yeah. about doing a measurement, then doing another measurement, and a complete set. And think about this. There are some setups where an enthusiast will have a screen, and you'll be listening to music or movies with the screen down. In other cases, you'll have that screen up. Maybe you'll have a different furniture configuration. Curtains. Curtains. All of that stuff. So 
you've been able to do measurements, save them, load them, and assign them to a different input. Now, Odyssey's never had that capability. Um, and it was really first introduced with the EQ editor app. So let me explain to you one way to do this. And then I'm going to tell you how cool it is with the 2020 and later uh, Denon and Marantz models. You can perform multiple measurements, save them and name them in the EQ app. And then when you're ready to play some content on your setup, all you have to do is load it right from the EQ editor app, load it up to your processor or your AVR. It'll take you about 60 seconds, boom, you're done. Well, the new models actually have an option called speaker preset. So what you can do is you can load different presets into the AVR and then either with the one, two, three, four keys that are in the uh, remote or using the option menu or any home automation system, you can instantly switch between presets. That is just a killer feature that um, has been introduced into Denon and Marantz ABRs. So the nice thing about that too, is if you have two different calibrations that you've done, you can call them up on the fly and see which one you prefer. Exactly. Exactly. So in your case, in your case, you don't have the dual speaker presets, but you do have the ability to store the entire configuration of your system through a USB. Yes. What, what I do in my particular case, you do have the ability to do it through USB. What I find to be the most convenient is simply to store it on the Odyssey app. Uh, so I'll have it on my phone. I'll, I can just send it over um, on the Mac side, either by email or using um, an airdrop. And then I have it both on my iPad and my phone. And then what I'll do is I'll take my uh, raw calibration and then I'll duplicate that. And then what I'll do is I'll do any tweaks or configuration changes that I want to a clone. And then I just name it appropriately. It might be screen down. It may be curtains up, whatever it may be. So yeah. not as elegant as what they've done, but uh, it's light years ahead of where we were just three, four years ago. So we got a super chat here from John Lim. Thoughts on Rats Budisi tool for tweak and curve editor files without using our fat fingers. Also, how come no one talks about three sub setup? I don't know about that tool you're talking about, but yeah, I wish the curve editor app would be easier to use, um, even being able to put manual um, EQ pre you know numbers in there and get the numbers in. That would be yeah. I mean, that's how the original, that's how the pro box was years ago. That thing was really easy to use in that respect. As far as three sub setup, um, I've, I've done odd uh, configurations of subs before. And generally speaking, in a rectangular room, you're better off with even multiples of subs. But if you're in an odd shaped room, um, I've done systems where I've had two subs up front and then I drove a sub in the back to, to take care of a null that I couldn't fix. And that's worked. But generally speaking, we go with two or four. This is another good question um, I'd like to answer here. So how many positions should we allow for Odyssey to calibrate? My experience is, you know, the eight, it's good to do eight measurements if you have the time, but you can get pretty good just doing four or five if yeah. you, as long as you don't abuse the positions of the microphone. I agree. I, I like either five or eight um, because if you're doing, and in the, my case, I'm doing 13.2 uh, so, uh, it takes about 45 minutes. Uh, so it's almost an hour by the time I'm done to do a calibration with eight positions. Yeah. And then if your wife comes in and moves the couch, you got to do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, do, do you have more slides? I think uh, we do, right? This is just the checklist. Uh, and then oh, okay. the dive and we're done and we can go right into the questions. So just to summarize, set up your speakers optimally. Don't shortchange it. Use the mobile app. Uh, leaving Odyssey to default will not deliver optimal performance in our opinion. And you'll notice that uh, with the base suck out and, and uh, the uh, mid-range performance. Um, measure with a proper microphone stand or tripod at ear level seated. Uh, increase the subwoofer uh, three to six dB to solve anemic base problems post calibration, but do that with by measuring. Uh, turn off mid-range compensation, uh, especially for high-performance speakers. Uh, set the fronts to flat versus reference. And you can limit Odyssey to the room's Schroeder frequency. And Gene, I know you'll put these in the notes uh, yes. at some point, but if you're playing this back, uh, just some great links to some articles. Uh, so some of them are a couple of years old, but they're still really relevant. 
Um, Sound United also has some uh, Odyssey room optimization uh, sections that are that are good. Um, we differ in some of our opinions here, um, but it's good there. And um, Pink Noise File Download. There you go. So I think everybody just enjoy, and we can now really dive into uh, the chat. So what I'll do is I'll put all those links in the description of the video below. And then for anyone that's a patron on our patreon.com slash audioholics, I'll put this entire slide presentation there so you could follow along at your own pace. So let's see what we got here. We got a lot of people watching on a Sunday night, man. People are really into their room correction stuff. huh? We have like 250 people online right now. Someone says Justice League was awesome. Can't wait for the disc. So I got to check that out. And I'm, you know, I put, I set up my mom's uh, system for HBO Max and I noticed the movie was in Letterbox. And I thought, uh, I, yeah, <clears throat> it's, it's the true IMAX. Uh, I happen to watch Justice League. So my unsolicited opinion is it redeemed the 2017 version. It was so much more coherent. Much really? More oh, yeah. Light years. Light so years. Was there a purpose to having that Russian family backstory that made no sense in the movie? Did they elaborate on it or was it just the same thing? Everything in the movie, everything in the movie just made so much more sense. The character development was better. Uh, maybe some parts were slower, but the family, everything was fleshed out so much better. I'm not a huge Snyder fan. I love Yeah, Freedom. me too. I have yeah. not loved, um, I, I have Man of Steel, but they haven't been my favorite um, DC Universe movies, but Justice League kudos to uh, what happened. Gotcha. So here's a, you know, I don't remember because it's been a while since I ran the Odyssey editor app. Joe Intel here is asking, setting the front to flat, does it undo the custom Odyssey curve? So if you're doing any editor app yourself, you don't want to set it to flat. You want to set it to custom, right? Like if you manipulate the curve, if you change the gains on the curve or something, I think you need to set that to custom. You may have to do that. I believe you're right. I don't have it in yeah. front of me, but I think you're right. So only time we say use flat is if you're as if you're going to run the yeah. whole system and you're not going to make any changes to the curve. Use the flat over reference because it's a better sounding curve in most cases. Let's see what else we got here. So, Gene, I think I just lost your audio. You, Gene, you're muted. I didn't hear anything you said. Say that again. So, Gene, while you're doing that, one of the questions is about setting the speakers to small. And what happens is when you set the speakers to small, that will give you a crossover of about 80 hertz. Um, and that used to be the uh, the THX standard. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with setting the speakers to small uh, to do that, to cross over to the sub. Can you hear me now? Yeah, just fine. So for some reason, my browser just randomly said I didn't have the right mic. I don't know what's going on, man. All right, we're back. What did I miss? All right. Uh, nothing. There was a comment about setting the speakers to small. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, here, let me let me give you a perfect example. I've just got in three different pairs of speakers in the AudioHawk Smart House. I got in the Paradigm Premier 800Fs. I got in the Focal Canta N2s and even the Revel F328BEs. And in all three of those cases, I would set those speakers small. They just do not have a lot of, even the Rebels don't have a lot of bass output. You know, you and I are both spoiled because we have RBH Super Towers. But those those type of speakers are ones that could keep up with the very biggest subwoofers, but these other speakers cannot. But you still get the benefit of, you know, 12 dB per octave below 80 hertz and then above 80 hertz, you get a lot more dynamic range out of a big tower, even when it's set small as opposed to a bookshelf speaker. No, very true. Um, there was a comment about IMAX enhanced, and that's a whole other discussion. Uh, when yeah. it comes, and the reason why it sounds so much better, the IMAX enhanced, because you're not getting it, it's been, it hasn't been reprocessed. You're actually getting the theatrical mix. And if it's non, 
uh, IMAX enhanced content, then what's happened is that has just, the audio has been reprocessed for a home environment. So you're not getting the same dynamics. And the one thing that I will um, note is there is a an IMAX enhanced setting in IMAX enhanced capable AVRs, but you do not have access to it unless you have an IMAX enhanced piece of content playing. Only then will the um. menu appear. So, so, so in that case, in IMAX enhanced doesn't do base management. So they want you to have all, which is stupid. Okay. I just don't agree with that. In the case, when you play an IMAX enhanced disc on your Denon, does it apply the global base management that you've done for every other mode? Does it give you the option or does it do it by default? Because you set all your speakers small. I don't have it in front of me. So I don't remember all the, the options. It does give you a crossover. Uh, which I believe it sets to 70 hertz, which is the IMAX standard. That's okay. my, opinion. don't quote me on that, but I believe so. And if you go into the menu, uh, the easiest way to do it is just to ping the IP address of your AVR uh, into a web browser, and then you can load the menu that way. So you'll see the crossover at 70 hertz, the default, and you can change that. Um, but then there's some additional settings. And my, my recollection is you want to keep the first one to auto and the second one that you can change. And I just don't remember what they are uh, off the top of my head. So that's a good future video topic. If you want to go and kind of take notes when you run an IMAX enhanced disc and how to do the setup on that, I think people would be interested in that. It's great. I mean, I don't, it's, it's amazing. Unfortunately, some of the great stuff that we get access to I love those IMAX enhanced discs that we got down in New Orleans from Sound United. Mm -hmm. It's just an amazing uh, way to, to demo and to calibrate a system. Yeah, I mean, that was an awesome demo. I was almost writing off the IMAX enhanced thing. I mean, when, when they played it on their DevTech speakers, and it, I think it was a Marantz SR8012 at the time, that was a killer demo that they gave. It's the real deal. And I think where we are, um, we're, we're tangenting a little bit. But you know what? We as enthusiasts, we want high performance content because the technology is able to reproduce it. You know, we don't want stuff mixed down for little Bose speakers that are, you know, four by four cubes anymore, right? Mm -hmm. we, you know, we want to be able to, to really enjoy and experience um, that theatrical mix. And IMAX Enhance is such a great step forward in that regard. Gotcha. So somebody's asking about the mid-range, should I have it on and off for, oh, I hit the wrong one. Should I have it on or off for my Klipsch RP? I think the if it's the RP 8000 Fs that we measured, that's actually that's actually one of their best speakers. Um, I know there was a lot of controversy over that speaker from another uh, YouTube channel that makes a business out of modern crossovers. But the reality of that situation is he measured that speaker too close. So it wasn't at its acoustic convergence point. So the little dip that was in that uh, crossover range was exaggerated. You could try it, but I don't think you would need it. Um, that speaker actually measured and reviewed very favorably, favorably by us. Man, I can't talk tonight. It's been it's been a long weekend, but yeah, I don't think you would need it, but you could try it. But in most cases, I would leave that um, mid range compensation curve or setting off. And you know, we probably should uh, a shout out to Bruce Carter. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. It's Disney, especially that um, has done some things. But yeah, not all the discs are are, are mixed the same. Wow! Shout out to Ken Do for a nine ninety nine super chat. Appreciate that, man. Very nice of you. So, you know, uh, I was trying I was just trying to think what I was going to talk about now. Oh, um, in our last conversation with Anthony Grimani, I didn't know this at the time, but Wonder Woman, the first one, not the atrociously bad second movie, but the first one doesn't use that many objects. It only used uh, four objects in the height channels. And I was wondering about that because when I played that back, it didn't give me a very convincing Atmos, you know, the immersive bubble. But supposedly the second movie has a better soundtrack. But I, I only heard it through HBO Max, and it was pretty good down here. Um, they did a pretty good job with it. I, I have such a beef with the studios that are shortchanging us as consumers mm -hmm. with what they're doing with immersive audio. Uh, it is such a beautiful art form 
to have a properly done immersive audio mix. And when you screw it up like that, and you know, either you're doing by limiting the amount of channels that you can play back with uh, a home theater setup or whatever, I mean, that's just wrong. Uh, and I don't know how we can, you know, make a stink to, you know, try to overcome that uh, and, and try to get the industry to change their ways. But, you know, dude, it's, dude, it's we are a statistical outlier. I mean, you're lucky if the average consumer has a five channel setup, let alone a nine channel setup. So the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Yeah, throw the Star <laughs> Trek in there. So. <laughs> Star Trek 2 has lifelong lessons, my friend. The Kobe, well, this is the Kobayashi Maru. Kobayashi Maru, yeah, I, I live by the Kobayashi Maru. Someone's asking, is Sir Vega going to make a reappearance? You know, that's an interesting question because I got a couple of emails from their marketing department that they wanted to do stuff with us, and then I responded and I got crickets. So I don't know. I used to, that, it's funny when that, even just to come up with that brand, that was like my first real speaker that I got when I was in high school. I had Sirwin Vega's D2s with the big 10 inch with the red surrounds. You remember that? I, totally I, I thought I was in heaven for like about a year or two. And then I decided one time to like take the drivers out. And then I was disheartened to see that there was no crossover. There was just this little capacitor on the piezoelectric tweeter. I'm like, oh my God. And then a year later, I upgraded to JBL and I was much happier. Yeah, you know, I learned a lesson early on about size and performance. Uh, I had a friend in college. I, I had back in the day, I had those three foot Fisher Tower speakers, right? That were part of the all in one. You'd get the cabinet and everything. Yep, yep. And you know what? My first year in college, one of my friends, Steve Booza, has these little infinity bookshelf speakers that annihilated yeah. the system from everything. Yep. Everything. And that was my introduction to a different perspective with audio and the hobby. So my friend in high school had a 15 inch three way Fishers and we pulled the woofer out. The magnet on his woofer was smaller than the magnet on my tweeter and my JBLs. I'm like, dude, there's something <laughs> wrong here, man. <laughs> it's back in the day. Back in Shout the day. out to no Iger more me. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. That's an interesting name. I don't know what it means, but. Yeah. There's so many questions. I don't know which one to answer here. Why are they making soundboard? Why are they making soundbars with 5.1 as a set? It's a soundbar. Well, you know, don't discount soundbars. I know people, you know, we use soundbars as punching bags in the past, but they've come a long way. And in fact, passive soundbars are a very big uh, expanding market. Serious passive soundbars. I'm using the Klipsch Heritage in my in my master bedroom leon makes incredibly good passive sound bars with you know top of the line cs drivers there's another company called um geez i don't even remember the theory audio theory audio uses uh really high performance drivers all dsp processing ten thousand dollar sound bar but it i heard it at cd and it was one of the best demos that i heard sound bars are convenient um i don't agree with the bouncy house ones that fire the the little tiny three inch driver up at the ceiling, they don't do a whole lot. And I know you'll see that on another YouTube channel where they claim all these wonders, but I've heard those sound bars and they're better than the TV speakers. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and then in order for that stuff to work, I mean, we've talked about the uh, Atmos enhanced speakers in the past or Atmos enabled speakers in the past. Uh, I've had both in my setup with the discrete, and then I've had um, some of those Atmos enabled speakers. Just call them bouncy house. <laughs> the bouncy house speakers. <laughs> I've reviewed several of them, and they're okay for particular applications. You don't get the discrete placement, but it does provide some sort of psychoacoustic effect. So when it comes to sound bars, yeah. you know your mileage is going to vary. You you have to have sidewalls. And it's just not going to work in some of these rooms where you've got the TV over to the side. You don't have a sidewall on the left or right side. The, the effect just isn't going to be there. So as long as I'm, I'm getting a sound bar for better sound than my TV has, and yeah. if I can get some semblance of that experience with the DSP. 
Well, you know? and the other the other thing about the bouncy speaker is not to go off topic too much, but um, when they first came out, I was like, this is not a good idea, with, especially without good directivity control and c- control and dispersion. And they really should be above ear level, right? They never even told you that. They just basically said, put them anywhere, put them by your fish tank. They're very easily localized if you're too close to a surround speaker. The other thing is that bounce effect only works in a very narrow listening area. It's not as good as when you have discrete speakers showering down at you. Super chat from Blue Kid. Thank you, my friend. Five dollars. Thanks. And I, yes, I'm looking forward to Godzilla versus Kong. I can't. Oh wait. yeah, I saw that. My brother is all amped up for that. He, he, my brother is like one of the most computer illiterate people you've ever met. But he figured out how to go through his Spectrum account, create an ID, so he could set up IMAX and ha- IMAX HBO Max. I'm sorry. All these I- Maxes, HBO Max on a smart TV, so he could get ready for Godzilla vs King Kong. <laughs> Quick aside is uh, before the pandemic, our local theater here did a Godzilla double feature night. So it was a community event. They had prizes. They had kids on stage, and they had one of the local hobby shops that had custom artwork for uh, all the Godzilla and kaiju themed movies. And it's just great. You know, I grew up on that stuff. I, I love the classic sci-fi and so, there's just nothing better. So when I was growing up as a kid, we had, you know, the eight millimeter cameras. I would spend hours doing stop motion Godzilla. My, we would always have a Godzilla in our Christmas village and I would have it crushing our Christmas village. And I had all these videos on that. We, I, Yeah, we all grew up with Godzilla. So this is a super chat to you from John Lim. Oh, somebody's really got the Greek. Yasu, John, thank you so much for giving me that. I haven't been to Sandorini. I'd love to go one day and look at the uh, sunsets. And you can't get paidakia, which are lamb chops, Gene. And mm-hmm. oh I, God, I love I lamb chops. Streets. Yeah, at, at wow. my church, we do lamb on the spit at our festival. So you got you got to come back to Florida when this pandemic thing is over. And I've got a couple of really good Greek restaurants that where i live now we have a food truck in my neighborhood and they have um it's i guess it's called mama ganoush or something like that so it's mediterranean kind of greek very similar but also tarp you've been to tarpon springs or no i have yeah i've, I've been to tarpon you know my uh my father-in-law was in, in clearwater beach you know that that other time when i came yep. to visit you and it's just amazing down there, the the Greek community. So you know what I'm going to do one day? I, I'm going to have to do Greeks and audio. So you know, I mentioned nice. uh, you know Michael K. Yeah, you know, I mean you have Class A. You know, yep. Kiriakidi. So that, that's going to be my long term project. Uh, the contributions of Greeks and the uh, high end audio. So I have a follow up on that super chat here. Gene on a super chat. I did my question was supposed to say, can going from two to four subs cause higher seat SPL deviation or what are the cons of more subs? I mean, unless you set them up wrong, no. It's four subs as opposed to two should actually even out the base response yeah. more and you'll get more dynamic headroom. Um, you know, this is, it's interesting because I always see on the forums, these people get these giant subwoofers like dual 18s or, like subwoofers that have way more output than their speakers. And I'm like, you got to have a balance. You, my point is I like to have the same dynamic range as if, if possible for the entire bandwidth. Right. And you don't necessarily need to get these giant subs because you got multi sub. That's why companies like JL audio, they don't make a bigger driver than a 13 inch driver. Their solution is add more subs. Right. And you do get a low frequency coupling effect uh, factor, even if they're not co-located so that you could get medium sized subs, get four of them in a room and it'll perform similar output as one super sub. And you'll have more seat to seat consistency. Agreed. And you know, most people don't know that that's the case. And if there's one thing that we can convey, at least in tonight's message is the importance of multiple subs um, for performance. Uh, Gene, with all the comments that are streaming down, uh, there's one comment about Basic Odyssey. With Basic Odyssey, do you recommend placing the mic at all of the eight locations in the diagram or simply at the main listening position? I've seen this recommended by a few people on YouTube. And no, no, not just at the main position. Absolutely. Uh, Gene and I agree. You should do at least five measurements. And if possible, do eight. You you want to get give Odyssey the data that it needs 
of what the audio looks like coming into that area. You know, you're not just in, your head's not just in one position and you need to give Odyssey the data that it needs. So uh, five to eight positions are what we recommend. Yeah. And, you know, just realize too, you're not going to get necessarily better sound on the sidewall. I mean, there's hardly anything you could do with EQ to fix that. And if you're, you really have to get good seat positioning. I, I see so many people that, that spend tons of money. Like I, I told you, I consult like five, six people a week now. And they want to, they have like $30,000 invested in speakers. And they're like, I need more speakers or I need better speakers. I'm like, no, you need better positioning. You need to get that couch off the back wall. You need to get that other couch off the side wall. You know, you need to treat your room a little bit. You can't have tile floors and glass everywhere. You got to get rid of some of that reflection. Like as Anthony Gramani said, you want to have about 15% absorption, 15% of uh, diffusion. That's a good rule of thumb. And Gene, two, two additional points to build on that. That's why it's important. The first um, measurement that you're doing has to be in that primary listening position and accurate because that's what Odyssey then uses to measure the speaker distances, if I'm not mistaken. And then to reiterate, because there was yes. a question in the chat, yes, absolutely. If you can do a room treatment before you apply any room correction, remember room correction is there, sort of as Gene's analogy, it's the icing. You don't want to make that your bazooka. Uh, that's not room correction. Room correction is there to take care of the other things um, that you haven't been able to address in traditional means. You know, the other thing, nice thing about that dual speaker preset is if you want two sweet spots, you know, if you have two rows of seats in my old theater, I like to sit in the front row for more music focus because it was closer to the front speakers. And then I sat in the back row for movie effects because that's where I had like eight surround speakers. So it's cool to not even necessarily the acoustic environment changing when you turn your curtains up or down, but actually to have two sweet spots, depending on where you want to sit, you could switch between those Agreed. Two different calibrations. So we have another super chat here. I have a Denon 4700 with front height and back height. Should I lie in the AVR or should I say in ceiling? What are the pros and cons? This is a good question because I've never gotten a straight answer from anybody I've asked. I've asked Dolby. I've asked Dan and I've asked the engineers that design this stuff. The reason why he's probably wanting to call them front heights and rear heights is because he wants to do oral 3d. That's what I've done too. And uh, if you don't, if you don't select heights instead of tops, you, you can't use the oral function on the receivers. So I can I speak a little bit with what I've done. If it's yeah. helpful, but Gene, why don't you finish your thought? I I'm not convinced that there's much of a difference other than an assignment, um, I'll let you speak on it because you've tested it both ways and you tell me what you think. So what I do in, in my particular uh, setup right now is I have the Dolby Atmos layout. So in, in my setup here, I have a canonical Oro 3D and I have a Dolby Atmos. So I have, I have both sets of um, in-ceiling speakers. Uh, what I've done is I'm using the Oro 3D layout um, but I'm actually using it with Atmos uh, placement, so to speak. Uh, so in the ceiling, in, right? In ceiling, okay. Yeah. And, you know, I've tested the, um, I don't remember which, the, those small speakers, the angled SVS as well. Um, prime did, elevation. The, the prime elevation. I had those in for review uh, and I, I tested those. Um, but right now I'm using my front Atmos speakers slightly forward of the RBHs. And then I'm using um, the side uh, height speakers on either side. And it just sounds great. I mean, it really, really does. I, Gene, you know this. I love Oro 3D. I just lost my concentration because what people... <laughs> 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 I have a green... I bought a green screen I was going to use um, on StreamYard, but the freaking thing's too small and I could see the rest of my room. So it's just sitting back there and it looks like I'm, I have a halo on me. All right. I don't know. I'm, there might be something there for the audio uh, enthusiast. <laughs> Somebody asked about LFE, and I just lost the question. Something about 100. All right. There was a comment here asking about the LFE setting, 80 or 120 hertz. That I would set it for 120 because the LFE track is separate from your subwoofer summed output. The LFE track can go up to 120 hertz, so just leave that on the full range or default setting. Oh, here it is. So we answer that. 
Got another super chat here from Brian. I don't want to say his last name because I'll butcher it. Gents, I plan to build a double base array. Okay. Any thoughts on this approach to even base in the home theater? I don't know enough about that to speak intelligently about it. I'll have to look that up, but um, it sounds cool. Anytime you can add more woofer to your system. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't answer that for you. If Matthew was here, he'd be able to answer it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's see what this is. Okay. Oh, this is interesting. I found some slight differences between specifying front height, rear height, and top front, top rear on my 8500 front. I can make some more audio objects. Oh, okay. I, I mean, yeah, I don't really know what it's doing, to be honest with you. I, I guess there's differences, but if it's so subtle like you're claiming and you want to be able to engage Oro 3D, personally, I think Oro 3D is a dead format. Um, I know people like the up mixer, but you know what? The Dolby Surround up mixer, when you turn center spread on, is incredible. So I wouldn't compromise my Atmos uh, placement just to accommodate Oro. I mean, unless you want to listen to like, uh, you know, obscure music from Europe because there's not a whole lot of even music selections in yeah, Oro 3D. Any of the discs here in the States, even when I've done the Oro uh, demos and we've done the reviews, uh, I've had to reach out to them and they've had to send me European discs. It's just not possible to get the stuff easily. And that's really frustrating. Um, yeah. I love the, up you and I have to talk offline about the Dolby center spread. On, so I can do that on the 8500 because I love the Oro 3D up mixer. It's what I use for all my standard content, unless it's native Atmos or DTSX or IMAX enhanced. So I played with the Oro. Before I moved, I switched. I did what you did with the speaker, Simon, so I could get Oro to work. And I was I didn't think the uh, Oro up mixer sounded any better than the Dolby up mixer when it was properly set up. So this is a good question here. With object-based surround formats, is there still a case for dipole, bipole surrounds? There's never a case for dipole surrounds, not with discrete audio. Dipoles should die. They were meant for the days when we didn't have uh, discrete surround sound and we were trying to simulate surround sound by using you know, mono mixes of rear channel info. Don't use dipoles at all. Bipoles is questionable. I My theater room, uh, a couple of years ago, I was using bipoles for my side channels because I have two rows of seats. And I wanted to have a lot of coverage. Um, when I switched to Atmos, <clears throat> I noticed I didn't hear much of a difference in the layers between the ear level and the height because I only had eight foot ceilings. There was only maybe a four foot differential. When I switched to monopoles, it was much better. Everything was more focused. I, I could hear the differential between the, the ear level and the height. I would, if you're doing Atmos and you're serious about Atmos and you don't have, you know, 12 foot ceilings or 10 foot ceilings, I would use monopoles all around a couple of feet above your level for your surrounds and then put your Atmos speakers in the ceiling and you'll be a lot happier. Gene, there's a question you might enjoy answering because uh, we've talked about this about uh, why does Odyssey set speaker levels uh, 12 dB lower using XLR or the balanced uh, connection versus the RCA? Well, there's, there's a 6 dB difference in the balanced versus unbalanced. Um, I'm not sure. Is it someone that set up a, a processor? It has to be a processor, and it has to be a Marantz at that point if they're using huh. um, balanced. But then that's the whole point is really the gain, and not a lot of people are aware that you know there's a difference between unbalanced or single-ended and uh, balanced or XLR. Well, the, the, well, the thing is... <sighs> If you have like, I know people like to bash on THX, but THX does set some good standards. Like they have a standard 29 dB gain in an amplifier and the XLR outputs are 6 dB hotter, but the XLR inputs of the amp are 6 dB lower. So the levels are the same yeah. as going from balanced to single-ended. But not everybody follows that nomenclature. I have the Anthem STR uh, separates and their balanced and unbalanced outputs are at the same level. And I've never seen that before. So everybody yeah, kind of how it always is with the anthem. It, you, yeah. but, you know, I, I did have that experience with um, the old anthem amps, and I would uh, I'd actually get more gain out of it using the XLR connections and single ended. And then they corrected that in the uh, the later builds of the MCA amps. So center spread is back because you guys 
took my call to action. And when I announced that center spread was silently taken out of receivers and I did a couple of videos and articles on it, it raised a lot of hell. And I think a lot of people wrote into Dolby because I got an email from all the engineers of uh, Sound United saying we're getting this feature back. So yes, you should have center spread back. And thank you guys for getting my back to get it back. I can't believe there's still this many people here, man. It's it must be the Greek. It's the Greek <laughs> luck. <laughs> there you go. It's <laughs> Ivakia. It's the layup yeah. during Lent here. Oh my goodness, man. I'm actually craving some Greek food right now. When when you got when you and Berta come over one day, I'm gonna grill. And I'm nice. gonna take care of you guys. You it's like some meat? Awesome. You got some Greek meat, it's very good. A little bit of everything. I'm going to make you some fresh tzatziki. What do you mean you don't eat no meat? That's okay. We have lamb. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. You know, um, as yeah. much as I I love my big fat Greek one, and that's what I'm quoting. Um, have you heard of a comedian named Sebastian Maliscalco? I haven't. I'm not. Oh, heard. my God. He Well, he is what is to the Greeks is to the Italians. He grew up in an Italian home. Everything this guy does is very relatable. If you grew up in New York and you're Italian, never talks about politics. He talks about his dad and it's just, it's comedy gold. Look him up on YouTube. If you can guys look up Sebastian Maliscalco. He is by far the best. He's got the best stand up game I've seen in years. Really funny. You're going to send me some links. We're going to have, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you some links. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said that uh, Anthem Arc is broken now, and I've heard mixed things about that. Um, I know they were having a problem with the independent subwoofer calibration, but I didn't think the Arc itself was broken. Now, you know, I, I don't want to speak authoritatively on this. I was on the Genesis beta team. So, uh -huh. you know, as far as I'm aware, if you have one of the pre-AVM 70 and 90 models, Oh, okay. I believe it's still working. Don't don't quote me on that. But you know, my I have my system dialed in and it's just fine. What my understanding is, there's a problem with the newer models um, that have come out uh, getting our Genesis to work. Uh, so there might be some uh, inaccurate information that I have there, but that's my understanding. Right. The doorbell joke is yes. Yeah, some, pe some people know uh, Sebastian. Man, you guys should really know him. Someone's asking about Hypex. Actually, we have a Purify. Uh, we built up a Purify module, an amplifier module, and we're going to be doing some bench testing on it because Class D is the future, my friends. As I've said before, I'm running all Class D in my theater room. It's Pascal module, which is really good. Chose the Pascal because they're productized more easily and they have good power supplies in them. Purify is probably the best measuring amplifier in the history, uh, except for maybe the benchmark amplifier but it's it's got an expandable platform it looks like it's really awesome i know the engineer that designed it the dude is brilliant bruno putzies it's like the best class d amplifier designer out there so yeah we will be covering that for sure all right so somebody's out here Teo. since you have all these odd speaker configurations which one would you recommend you know, the funny thing is I don't have wides. So that's the one thing I can't comment. So, and on. that's like the most significant upgrade you can make. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Because will... we hear, we hear, we sense direction better laterally than we do above us and behind us. So, I mean, it's harder to implement wide speakers. Um, I really wish they would come out with a speaker that's a flush mount wide that has an angle baffle, you know, yeah. that could, it would be yeah. such way more practical than sticking a tower right in a walkway path. Well, that that's the problem in the setup. You know, my I'm 14 feet wide here in this space and okay, you know, putting the wides in really causes a problem. That's actually an excellent point from from a design uh Yeah. I've asked RBH and they're like looking into it, but what I did for now is I pre-wired for wides, but I put in in ceiling. I put an extra pair of front speakers on angle baffles. And I'm going to try to run those as wides and see what it sounds like. Otherwise, I'll just run them as an extra pair of high channels and I'll wait to do the wide upgrade. Got one more super chat from Can Do. Man, you're on fire tonight. Thanks for the great info. When you mentioned bipolar dipoles being bad, I use Klipsch RS62s as surrounds and I have 7.1.4 setup. Should I replace them? Are they bipolar? Are these 
I don't know if those are dipoles or bipoles. I'm not familiar with that model. Um, if you like the way they sound, don't, you know, don't just change stuff because I said it. I mean, if you like it, stay with it. But ultimately speaking, I'm not a big fan of dipoles at all for discrete surround sound. I've heard the difference. Um, bipoles can work in a big room. If you have, you know, big seating area and you want to have better coverage and you have enough height differential from the ear level to your tops. But if you don't, and if you can't localize the difference between, you know, the surround speakers and your high channels, then you might want to look at doing monopoles. I ran some like pink noise tests in my old place, and I could not tell when I had bipoles on if the speaker was in the ceiling or on the side of me. And when I went from the side channel to the height channel, it was very hard for me to tell the difference until I switched to monopoles. Has anyone tested or owned the JBL synthesis? Anthony, we got another super chat from Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. Guys, I, I'm like trying to end this here, but everybody's like still going. <laughs> and I don't have my chocolate fixed tonight. I didn't bring any chocolate up here. You know, uh, Anthony Gramati and I, we have chocolate competitions. And I've been eating way too much chocolate since he's been doing live streams with us. And you're into chocolate too. I mean, you yeah. have a chocolate... Guys, if you want really good chocolate, go to Whole Foods or even go to like your local supermarket. Look up the bar Teo. It's there. It's him. <laughs> they branded it him. I wish. I wish. And well, I like the I, I like it. the one that's salted. It's like a dark. It's like a seventy percent dark with salt. Really good. Delit, you sent me a bar. If you that's remember. right. That was kind of <laughs> <laughs> I'm a wise ass like that. <laughs> well, what I will tell you is, so if one anybody is a chocolate snob. And I mean, really, really, yeah. really loves chocolate. Then what you have to do is you have to get some of the champagne infused truffles from La Maison du Chocolat. So yes, you, my wife orders that. They, they come in that box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gave them to my wife when we got engaged, and uh, they have a store in Manhattan. They've got a couple of them. And uh, at that time, the owner, uh, the president, uh, Robert uh, Lynx, if I remember correctly his name, he did a chocolate taste testing. They had a private room in the back. So we had, I think it was a, a two-hour session with the president of the company sampling the best chocolate from everywhere in the world. So oh, let me man. a lot is to die for. Oh, you're getting me hungry now. Greek food and chocolate. What else would you want? There's nothing more you want. That's right. I didn't mention Leonida, so I guess I should have. Leonida chocolate. <laughs> yep, yep. All right. Oh, you know, uh, oh, Elvin. Hey, buddy. Elvin's another RBH guy. He's got the SVTR, SVT system like you do. How's it going, Elvin? Thanks for the super chat. Elvin, the best speakers, aren't they? They're fabulous. Yeah. Really cool. You know, I wanted to tell you, I, was, I put on um, Disney Plus. Yeah. And I was... This is the first time I, you guys have to bear with me. I'm not usually a TV person, but I got uh, the 2021 uh, Sony TVs, the um, 900 series, really incredible. I have an 85 in my family room and a 65 in the bedroom. And when I put on Disney Plus and I put on Star Wars, it was in, um, it was in Dolby, in the uh, Dolby Enhanced. So, I couldn't believe the picture quality of it. Uh, Dolby Vision, Dolby Vision, yeah. Holy shit. Man. Yeah. Yeah, right? I mean I actually found myself watching Jar Jar Binks again. <laughs> <laughs> Misa thinks that you're so gonna like it, Jim. Oh sc that's scary, man. You're good. You're good. You ever you ever watch Robot Chicken? <laughs> Palpatine Robot Chicken is canon. I don't care what anybody says, that's more canon than the Star Wars sequels. Freaking Seth MacFarlane, man. He's brilliant. <laughs> I watch that stuff all day long. It just cracks me up. That's great. <laughs> nice. Nice. There you go. The real see, deal. You see, and I, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to cross promote platforms. Like I want to, I want like chocolate companies and things that are not related to home theater, I want these kind of guys to advertise on Audio Hawks because we don't just listen to music. We we consume things, right? We're consumers. We consume good audio. We consume good food. 
I want to get these kind of these other companies here, man. I need some help with that. Maybe you could help me. I want to get some of these chocolate companies advertising and to give us some free samples. I mean, that was an unsolicited, unplanned product placement. Yes. And it's hey, just- James Larson's here. All right. I'm getting him a camera so he can start live streaming with us. So somebody is asking him a question. Any opinion on Emotiva or Monolith processor? Um, James, I know James reviewed the HTP one and it's awesome. Check out my review and it works. It's pretty, uh, it's a solid platform. We have that review on the audio hogs. It should still be on the audiohogs.com homepage. I should probably do a video overview of, of his review because it was actually a really good review, really thorough. Seems like such a, I mean, unbelievable what Monoprice has done in such a short period of time. It's yeah. amazing how they've really embraced the home theater crowd. Yep. Oh yeah, it's incredible. This is pro- and the guys behind some of the engineers behind the driver designs that they have. Since this you- is unsolicited product placement, I mean, this is the headphone amp that I use. Oh, the oh, that's the THX one, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm a, you know, I'm a huge fan of the, so AM. that's the same, that's the same, uh, circuit topology that's in the benchmark uh, yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, you know, the guys behind, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but fuck it. It's one o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. Who's listening? Um, the guys behind the driver design of, of the, uh, model price subwoofers, those really hard hitting subs is the same guy that's behind the Paralisten speakers that we're going to be talking about real soon. Have you seen that company Paralisten? I they just, are dropping a hammer, man. Hammer. Wait, I just can't wait to get those speakers in. I want to hear your, yeah, you're going to call me and you're going to tell me your impression of the speakers once you turn them on because I read the first impressions, the review. It's yeah. the first speaker to ever, ever reach that. THX Dominus. <laughs> Dominus. Dominus. THX Dominus. Put it this way: When I'm on the phone with the guy that that's a designer of that company, I feel like an idiot. Like this guy is just so wow. intelligent. You know, like you, you ever get into these conversations with people that just know? Like this guy's been in the industry I mean, for like decades. You talk to you, right? Any of us among the audio uh, you know, reviewer crowd. It's like you know, I don't know if everybody understands this, but there's multiple peer reviews that happen every time we do a review. So if I get a review back that isn't at least, you know, maybe less than 25% marked up, I feel like I got an A from, because Gene is always the last one to peer review, always two individual two peer reviews. And the first one is my most brutal uh, reviewer. His name is Steve Feinstein. He used to be the marketing director of Atlantic Technology. He rips our reviewers a new asshole. He's like, why did you say this? This is terrible. And he'll go and he'll put a book report on how you should change this. So yeah, we, our stuff is pretty well vetted. Hey, we got another super chat from Anthony. Should I connect from a Blu-ray player to an older AV receiver via RCA? If the Blu-ray player has a good DAC, I have the Panasonic 9000. That's a good Blu-ray player, but you won't get multi-channel surround if you do that. Um, If you're, I don't know if the Panasonic supports SACD or high res but if you want to do two channel you could do that but ultimately the only way you're going to get multi-channel and atmos is through hdmi so no i generally speaking i don't recommend just doing analog and, yes and also be asking is if i have an older avr and yet i have really a top of the line it's almost like having the udp 205 the oppo is yeah. hey if you it's a pretty good dac that's in there and if that DAC is better than what's in the AVR, then you know what? You may actually hear uh, a difference. Yeah. Man, I still have my UDP 205. I am not selling Dude. that. <laughs> I sold my 203 for almost double the retail. And now, now they're going for like triple. I mean, you, it's, hard to get a, it's hard to get a universal Ultra HD Blu-ray player that also does SACD. You're right. I, I have a 203 here. I have the 205 with the um with the revels and i'm not getting rid of them uh i stream rune through them flawlessly it's great they sound great they handle everything and you know we as audio enthusiasts we lost quite a bit when oppo had to bow out 
um, of the crowd, and we're looking for help oh, to take command. Well, there is there is a company coming. I have a write up. I haven't published it. We have like thirty articles in admin right now, ready to publish. Like I'm I'm a content hoarder, so I try to just space it out so I can keep the traffic going, you know. But there is a company that's using the MediaTek platform that looks like they're trying to fill the shoes of Oppo, and I should publish that probably. I guess I'll publish it at the end of next week. I'll send you a copy and I'll put it on our Patreon so everyone can read it on Patreon first. Great. But yeah, it looks like there's a company that's trying to fill the shoes of Oppo now. That'd be great. Yeah. So I think we're going to wrap this up. It's an hour and 45 minutes. It's late. You got to go to work tomorrow. I got to get up and drive my daughter to school. It's always fun. And then get a couple hours of sleep and start all over again. So... <laughs> It's always fun hanging out, Gene. You know, it's just like we we can't do our in-person visits, but just being able to just kind of, um, you know, shoot around and talk about this stuff and we'll just uh, air the laundry on a live stream at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> do Jar Jar Binks? I do. I do a frightening. That's a really good one. No, no, I do a frighteningly good Elmo imitation as well. Uh, so we'll leave those impersonations for another time. Don't let me start doing Palpatine on you. <laughs> 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 oh man don't get me going it sounds great, man. last super chat here any news concerning hmi 2.1 bug found on yama ivr's denons there is a solution in sight and i can't announce it yet um you guys are going to be happy if you're a sound united owner and it should be coming soon that's all i could say about that without getting in trouble it's great and i think my wife said spare us elmo so <laughs> 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 we're gonna have to have our wives on cleo and i have talked about this good idea we're yeah have the the audio file wives my wife is going to start a blog about what it's like to live with an audio file and a home theater aficionado so we've we've got it all set and i'm putting myself out there for total embarrassment and i'm ready we need to have more women in audio, man. I mean, yeah. my let me tell you something cool about my wife. We're, we're setting up this audio hawk smart house. And I'm like, you know, we should do all flush mount in the family room, like on the front wall and everything, right? She's like, no. She goes, I want box speakers in there. I'm like, are you crazy? I already have eight foot towers in my theater room. I've got five foot towers in my, in my uh, music room over here. You really prefer that? She goes, yeah, I don't want to have all these holes in our walls. I'm like, all right, then. <laughs> and I could always upgrade them. I, I know they're small now. I started out with the Paradigm 800Fs. I, I have a feeling like those are going to be flagship towers in a couple of years. Anthony sent us another super chat. What other? What are some old, older good center speakers for the top of your head? Uh, well, you can look at our reviews. James Larson's covered a ton of speakers. Um, he really liked, not too old, but the, the Polk um, center channel. In their legend series was really good um trying to think of older ones older 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 anything with a wtmw driver configuration is tends to be really good you know instead of just i mean mtms could be good too like um and gene why don't you define that for some like the woofer tweeter mid-range you got a woofer on each side then you got a mid-range and then a tweeter don't ever get a center channel that has tweeters on up opposite ends of the cabinet that's white van material <laughs> <laughs> it's white van don't ever do that five thousand dollar speakers and if you buy yeah. them right now i'll give them to you 80 percent off hey i'll tell you if you want to hear some good old speakers man the old snell like the a5s and the, 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 the whole era of snell from like the late 90s early 2000s when kevin was there kevin books from uh harman they made some great sounding speakers for the old stuff um i you know the best that the best center channel speaker i've heard to date it believe it or not is the the rbh sv 821 and that's just two eight inch woofers with the amt tweeter in the middle it, it, it's active and when i got that thing dialed in i was like holy cow the, the vocals sound so incredibly real and clear and I'm going to be using a version of that that matches my main speakers. It's got the three eights and it's going to be in the wall behind the acoustically transparent screen. So it's going to be at the same listening level as the main speakers. But some of the older, some of the older infinity uh, center channels, they, the, the infinity had a primus center channel that had two mids, a tweeter, and then two woofers on the side. I forgot the model number. That was actually a pretty good center channel too. 
You know, Anthony, if you can get them used, the original Performa, the Revel Performa Center Channel is excellent. Uh, I still use the uh, Performa 2 right now uh, with the salons, and it's just a really great uh, center channel. Uh, and even though you want it older, uh, S the SVS Ultra Center Channel is fabulous. Uh, I love it, and it's, it's what I use um, down here. Yeah, what do you so you have three systems then, right? You have the RBH system, you have the Revel system, and you have SVS, right? Yeah, and the, I've got the SVS right now mixed in with the RBH because the RBH is uh, just the front, um, the left and right channels. Oh, okay. And then I've got an SVS uh, 16 Ultra uh, paired yep. with the salons. There you go. There's a there's a good one. Yeah. God, you do you ever did you ever hear the Infinity Prelude MTS? No. Oh man, see, I'm I'm old school. I'm like, that was the first speaker that Har that Harman came out with that had active uh, bass control. Like they, you know how they have their sound field management system now. This was like the first iteration of that. I think it was like a one or two band parametric equalizer, and it had bass modules on the sides and a bunch of mids and a tweeter, and that was like one of the best speakers Infinity made. And now Infinity's like. They don't do anything with the brand anymore. It's sad. It was such an incredible. What what was that one? It was like sixty thousand dollars, and it had the um, the line array of tweeters, and then yep. the separate, uh, you know, bass array. That so was that was bef that was before Harmon, and I sold one of those systems when I worked at Cooper for Stereo in the nineties in Saint Petersburg, and that was a bitch to move. Paul <laughs> McGowan of uh, PS Audio just got one. He got yeah. a one i think yeah and, i mean that was just back in the heyday that was an incredible system takes up a lot of space yeah a lot of space yeah i had a i had to install one of those i always got picked on back in the day because i was into bodybuilding so they're like oh just let gene move all the heavy equipment now i have a bad back to prove it thank you i don't like moving heavy equipment anymore <laughs> i'm right there with you class d all the way yeah really definitely small satellites and lots of subs all right, with that said, I'm going to wrap this up. Teo, thank you for taking this much time. Two hours, man. That's crazy. Thank I don't thank think I've ever done a live stream this long. But you know what? We've held over 200 people in here for two hours. That says something. That says that they like you more than they like me. So we'll keep you coming back. <laughs> no, they just want the Greek food and they want the chocolate advice. That's it. I know. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this live stream. Um, don't forget about subscribing to the channel, hitting that bell notification. That way you know when we're doing these events. Don't forget about our Patreon at patreon.com slash audioholics. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. <laughs>